following program is a presentation of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio in iTunes. It's time for Volatility Views, the premier radio program for volatility traders. Each week, we'll dive into the world of volatility, how to manage it, profitable strategies, and how to avoid the pitfalls of trading volatility. If it involves volatility, you'll find it on Volatility Views. And now, the Volatility Exchange is proud to present your hosts, Mark Longo and Don Schlesinger. All right, and that music means it's time once again for Volatility Views, your weekly source for all things volatility. My name is Mark Longo from the optionsinsider.com as well as the Options Insider Radio Network, upon which many of you are listening to this program right now. And we're excited for another great episode of Volatility Views today. Joining me on the Volatility Views panel. Panel. First up, we have my cohort, my partner in crime, the degenerate volatility buyer himself, none other than Don Schlesinger from the Volatility Exchange. Don, bite, welcome bite your to the tongue show. and watch your line. Yeah. <laughs> there are options you should buy. There are options that should be bought and options that should not be bought. That's what Don always says. <laughs> Don, not exactly known for his degenerate premium buying. Can, can you recall? Or maybe we'll get to it in the mailbag because I'm going to ask a similar question. So maybe we'll save it for All then. Right. But there think think up of the times in your career, Don, when you may have purchased a contract. And well, uh, that, we'll, that, we'll get that, to those. That's really easy to do. It doesn't take too long. <laughs> <laughs> when in doubt, palms out, Schlesinger. That's what I'm call you from now on. Um, and then also joining us on the old Volatility Views panel today, Mr. Mark Sebastian from OptionPit.com. Mr. Seabass, welcome back to the program. Woo, indeed. It is fun to be back on Volatility Views. Yeah, isn't it nice to get back? I mean, here's what I heard while we were gone is, when are you guys going to start doing the show again? Because it's the most interesting, thought-provoking, and powerful discussion on, you know, high-end market stuff and volatility that, that really exists. There's no nobody that touches this space like volatility views and it was a tragedy that was gone and it is thankfully back. Yes, a lot of, we've gotten a lot of the same feedback from our listeners and our readers to that exact same effect saying, Thank God the show is back. My summer was so dreary without the voice of Don Schlesinger in my ear every, every Well, I week. guess that does it for next summer's <laughs> vacation. We'll just have to cancel that. Yeah. All right. And now with the team assembled, we're going to dive right into the volatility review. It's time for the volatility review. All right, and welcome to the Volatility Review. This is where, of course, we dive into the week's worth of action from a volatility perspective. And maybe before we even do that, really quickly, I have an interesting thing that's floating around the, the back of my mind from a conference I went to this week, and I'm, I'm eager to share it with you two on the panel here today to see, what your, see if your reaction was as shocked and dismayed as mine was when I heard it. I was at an options conference this week in New York, uh, a big industry show, and I was sitting in on a panel uh, about buy side options and buy side participants and how they're not really using options. And there were a couple of people on the panel who were more pro option, a couple of people on the people on the panel who were kind of more, I wouldn't call them anti option, but they just don't use them as much and they're kind of getting their mindsets on why they are the way they are. And one of the more, I guess, less options <laughs> users of the panel or, or more anti options users of the panel, at one point someone asked him, What do you do to manage your tail risk in these types of, you know, black swan or quote unquote type of events? And he said, Yeah, yeah, you know, we do we use puts, they asked him. They said, well, you know, we looked at that and we looked at hedging with our tail, tail risk with puts and we found that that tail risk premium in puts was just so high, we couldn't justify that and, nor, and our clients weren't happy with us 
doing that or coming to them with that idea. So we decided that instead of buying a put to hedge our near term risk, we started thinking, why are we buying a put? If we were thinking about buying a put, shouldn't is that does that change our fundamental outlook on the stock? So we decided whenever we want we think we think we want to buy a put, we're just gonna sell the stock and go to cash instead. <laughs> and that completely blew my mind. And I had to stand up and kind of interrogate them a little bit after that point because I I just couldn't believe what I had heard. But have you, Don or you Mark, ever heard anything like that in your in your life? Well No, um, that was the, maybe the that shows you why some of these buy side managers do so poorly. Why the fact that there are managers that are given that much money that are that ignorant of how financial markets work is scary and shows you why we end up with crashes. You know, if if intelligent people like Don managed big big money like that, we we probably would be Pension funds and money managers and things like that would be in much better shape. Instead, we get these yahoos that have no idea what they're talking about, don't understand hedging practices, blowing up people, blowing up pension uh, plans. It's the it's the silliest thing I've ever seen, <laughs> and yeah. I don't get it. It's, and it's, the, I, I'm insulted that a guy like that has money. <laughs> You know, it's it's kind of strange just on, on a number of levels. Uh, the things that jump out at you are all sorts of uh, tax implications, number one. You know, if you're just going to turn around and, and, and sell stocks re regardless or irrespective of cost basis or anything else and trigger taxable events, some of which are obviously uh, short term. If you're going to do this all year long, uh, there, there are some terribly negative aspects to that. Second of all, as everybody listening knows, if you own a portfolio and you uh, buy a put, the combination, if you're if you're fully protected, you know, a uh, hundred percent of the notional is that you've really created a synthetic call. So when you own puts with a portfolio, you retain all of the upside, obviously, so that just in case your crystal ball isn't quite as wonderful as you think it is, and the market goes up despite your negative expectation, which which caused you to want to take the action. You participate fully in the upside. You liquidate all of your stocks. You're out of the market. Obviously, you've you've lost that whole possibility. So uh, it's 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 clearly an awfully strange point of view. Yeah, it's it's a troubling one, and you're right. It is somewhat disturbing to think that people can still amass money to manage in this day and age without even the basic skill set uh, of being able to buy a put or understanding why you might want to do that. Apparently, near-term downside protection is not an issue with these people. Uh, but yeah, just uh, it, that blew my mind, and it's been kind of resonating with me all week, and I just... This is the first show I've recorded since I've been back, so I just had to get it off my chest. But. You know, his original <laughs> premise that this is very costly and... Uh, yeah, I can know, understand you that. that. Yeah. You can't, you can't argue with that, but until somebody comes up with a better alternative, uh, you know, that's, the, that, and, and, that's and, the problem. Well, and he'd rather be in cash than collar his position. Yeah, that's what I thought. I thought he was going to say, well, then I turn to a collar, or I, maybe I do a put spread yeah. to limit my exposure. No, I just sell it all. Yeah, <laughs> I, mean, I mean, that's just the... It is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. It was it was that, fantastic. I mean, it just shows you what's wrong with long only people. If someone says they're a long only fund, just say long only dash dash sign idiot. Mm. <laughs> That's a great marketing slogan for them going forward. Uh, speaking of going forward, I didn't mean to hijack the show with this, but it is something interesting. I'm sure a lot of our listeners are probably in the same boat as we are, just amazed that that, could, that mindset is still prevalent on the buy side, but indeed it is. Uh, but, Don, let's look back now at now, this. How much money was that guy managing, do you know? Uh, it was many millions. I, don't, I didn't hear. I missed the early part of the panel, so I don't know the exact amount, but uh, they said they had. It was a small fund, like 10 clients, but they were, I think, substantial clients. I think the clients were also somewhat risk-averse, which might, may have played into their aversion to using options. Yeah, well, uh, those clients, with all their money, are being disturbed by that guy. I, I would say so. <laughs> but, Don, let's look back now. It's been an interesting week. Certainly a lot of big events happening while I was off in New York, uh, including uh, the Fed coming out and a lot of interesting developments on the vol front. So Apple, of course, a big player in the NASDAQ coming out with their – not an earnings announcement, but what is tantamount to an earnings announcement for them, the announcement of their annual new iPhone. So a lot of big events to really move vol this week. What mm -hmm. what were you seeing from a, a vol perspective in NASDAQ there, Don? 
Well, of course, you know, there's there's always a distinction, as, as Mark will make, I'm sure, uh, momentarily between uh, perception and implied volatility and uh, actual or realized volatility. So because over at Volex, we're, we're engaged in the real volatility space, I would say to you that despite the fact that the, the markets, all of the indices have, have clearly been on the rise and closing in on, on historical highs uh, due to this past week's action, we, we did mention, and it turns out to be correctly, uh, at the conclusion of last week's show in the crystal ball that realized volatility, both for S&P and NASDAQ, was so low, single digits, uh, historically at uh, uh, really uh, unusually low levels that it probably didn't make a lot of sense to predict anything that they would start to ratchet up. And in the case of NASDAQ, realized volatility, at least on a uh, one month, 21 day looking backward basis, went from 1086 to 1274, which was uh, uh, a 17% increase over the week. And uh, the, the S&P, again, on a realized volatility basis, went from 904 up to uh, 1098, which was about a 21.5% increase. Now, as, as listeners know, while this was happening, because these up moves were, were rather dramatic, you know, 23 handles the other day on the S&P, so that's going to create realized volatility regardless of the direction. Uh, because of that negative correlation uh, with implied, uh, all the while that realized was uh, going higher, we did see yet again uh, VIX, uh, except perhaps for today, decreasing sharply once again to under 14 and into the 13 handle. So again, for everybody to distinguish between what implied volatility sometimes does in opposite direction to market movements and what realized volatility does, which is actually measuring the magnitude of the move regardless of direction. Speaking of realized volatility, I had a conversation yesterday with an options reporter for an enormous, very large, very prestigious financial publication, shall we say. I won't name the name because I don't get this person in trouble. But they came to me yesterday and said they were writing an article about the VIX, and they included the term realized volatility in it, and their editor came back to them and said, this term confuses me. Take it out of the article. We can't have that in the article. So they cannot <laughs> write. This is I, – I, I can't – I can't belabor. This is a very established publication in the financial realm, and they cannot use the term. They cannot about. use the term "realized volatility." Yeah. Well, so, welcome to our world. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. You know, Don, the interesting thing I think involving realized volatility is implied volatility has been playing even now. You'll all recall vol is most overpriced when it's when it's a little lower, but the spread between realized and implied has been incredibly wide. And what that actually points to is, believe it or not, more people are, are really insuring with options than we realize. So what I found that's really interesting, and I wrote about this on my blog, optionpit.com slash blog, where has the realized volatility been? It hasn't been in sell-offs like we traditionally think. Since June expiration, we've had five major moves and by and by major moves i'll call them greater than one and a half percent right so th that's that's bigger than a uh, so that equates to about a uh, you know a, a single day vol of about 24 percent right okay all of the major moves have been rallies not sell-offs we every move over 20 some odd points since June expiration has been a move higher, not a move lower. And so it's interesting. And this is where hedging risk and, 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 you, and the concept of a realized vol contract versus an implied vol contract could be really interesting. The realized vol risk is in up moves right now because the spread between implied and realized is so wide, it points toward more people owning puts than we actually, or owning VIX or owning some sort of protection. 
is much greater than many people realize. Interestingly, though, the only place where volatility has actually been, I think, consistently underpriced has been in some of the major tech names. You know, the Apple, you know, I, I went on Bloomberg earlier in the week ahead of the Apple announcement. Don, you would have you would have been mortified. <laughs> I suggested buying ahead of the announcement for about a 25% volatility. Uh, no, it's about, excuse me, it's about a 30% a volatility. The Apple weekly with three days to expire, yeah. 665 straddle for about $18.5. Uh, I can see Don's about to pass out in his chair right no, now. No, I actually <laughs> read that. I, I read what Mark wrote. Yeah, and my argument was that you know, the previous day it had moved 21 bucks. And, you know, especially if you're scalping gamma, but even if you're not, to me, a the risk reward of going long, you know, forced to be in an option position into that meeting, the risk reward of long versus short. And this is where the concept of, I think, gamma comes into, which is not a part of a realized vol contract. Although really, Realized vol is all gamma, right? If implied volatility is I was going to say, it's pretty much a pure gamma contract yeah, for the most part. Yeah, really. You're well, right. Actually, it, it's, it's interesting because it turns out that it's a kind of a hybrid because yeah, it's a, it's during the calculation volatility. period, what we call the realized volatility period, we are delivering as a, a, an expiration value realized volatility over the given maturity, one month, three months, and you know perhaps even a, mm -hmm. a one-year contract. But we're going to list these contracts prior to the start of the realized volatility period as much as perhaps three months or six months to actually list them and trade them leading up to that calculation or realized volatility period. So it's pretty much expected that during what we're calling that anticipatory period, the Vol contracts, which settle to realize volatility, will still have this implied component where yeah. people are trying to forecast and get a handle on what that final value well, will be, and they'll know, probably trade similarly to you know VIX futures until we start running the clock and the meter is ticking. Yeah, I think it's going to trade actually. You know, the interesting thing, you know, you'll it'll trade, it'll go from VIX future to much more like a a cash contract in the similar way that you see Vega come out of an option as gamma is increasing. Yes, so that's correct. It's gonna, it'll, it'll be a really, really interesting and unique contract. So, you know, Don, the point is, is that at that point with three days to go, what I was saying was, yeah, you know, the vol is probably a little overpriced on an annualized basis, but in the near term, the gamma risk, short versus long, just it doesn't add up if you're right. put into a situation like that. And I'd rather eat the three dollars on I'd rather eat the, the three or four dollars that it might be overpriced relative to the what the gamma could do if we move. And lo and behold, if, you know, at its peak, that contract was that contract for 18 and a half bucks was, you know, over a ten dollar winner. So, yeah. You know, it never fails to bet with the Apple zealots. Right. And, well, and, and lo and behold, Wal they announced that, hey, Walmart's going to list the iPhone. And all of a sudden, one, I think long term, Apple is making a mistake there because it's going to take any of the glamour out of that phone. And, um, and, but in the near term, it will increase sales dramatically. You know, there's a 3GS available for free at just about anywhere you get a drugstore almost. You can go get the 3GS for free now. Or maybe the, actually yeah. the iPhone 4. So I'm not sure how much glamour is left in the iPhone. But, yeah, uh, well, interesting the stuff. Well, iPhone 5 will be really, ooh. Yeah, it'll, it'll, it'll move the numbers. It'll move the needle dramatically. In fact, we have a good question coming up in the listener mail about Apple and Apple Vol skews. So maybe let's do that. Let's just dive right into the mailbag because we have a lot of great um, pent-up questions that have been coming in from I our summer hiatus. talk Apple and Apple Well, there's some good ones in here I think you might appreciate Mr. Sebastian. So let's dive yeah. right into the old listener mailbag. Listener mail. Listeners right in. Listeners right in. Mailbox. 
All right, and welcome to the old mailbag. This is where we dust it off and see what you, the reader, has to say. And be, before we dive in really quickly, some of you have been wondering, like Don, our own co-host here, what happened to the forums on the Options Insider? And yes, we did take them down briefly. Uh, we did just launch a major overhaul of the site and ported the entire site and the back end over to some new systems. And that included adding a comment system to the site now. So now every article you see, including some of Mr. Sebastian's crazier rants, you can let your own voice be heard on those articles and post them in the comments. Comments, and we'll be able to pull your comments onto the show as well. We probably will get the forms back in some way, shape, or form. We're still figuring out how exactly we're going to do that and what shape that will take. But if you're interested in joining us, in addition to all the other ways you can get us, Twitter and Facebook and email and everything else, send us an email, info at theoptionsinsider.com or even questions at theoptionsinsider.com. You can also post a comment on our site. And if we find some interesting ones that are vol-related, we'll put them up here on the show. But starting off with a little bit of love and a comment, actually, someone figured out the new commenting system. It's not too hard. You've seen it on other sites. <laughs> this is a comment from Ted, and he just writes, getting back to what we were talking about earlier in the show, I loved last week's show. I'm very glad to have Valve use back in the saddle. And Ted, we're all very glad to be back in the saddle, as you can tell. We're all uh, full of love here on the old Valve Views show this week. <laughs> Next up, we have an email from Kristen C. in Ohio, and I, as soon as I saw this one, I said, oh, Sebastian's going to love this one. We have to put this on the show. Uh, she writes, my financial advisor recently recommended that I allocate a portion of my portfolio over to VXX because, quote, VIX is low. Oh, I, my I, I God. I didn't know he, what he was Fire talking about. Fire financial advisor immediately. Yeah, well, that's... that's Fire. This is exactly what I expected. Let me finish the question. Uh, God, Mark, let him finish the letter. <laughs> I, did, I didn't know what he was talking about. When I Googled VXX, I came across this program and have learned quite a bit. Thank you for informing me, but I'm still uncertain as to his VXX recommendation, especially after hearing your comments about TVX. Should I allocate some of my portfolio to VXX? And I have my own thoughts, but I'll let Mr. Sebastian weigh in first since he is chomping no, or champing no, at the bit. No, no, no. And fire this financial advisor for not doing his research. I'm sorry. If you're a financial advisor and you're suggesting your clients allocate to VXX, you have no business being a financial advisor. That is one of the most – that guy, we've, the, the cash-only money manager has now been usurped by this guy as <laughs> dumbest guy He's handing out advice. He's been trumped in the same show. But... Sorry. You, whoever that guy is, you first post his name everywhere and say, no matter what, do not use this guy because he's not doing his own research. Now – if you're looking for a good product that you can own that will give you volatility exposure, that is an ETN, the product that will not bury your account is X-Ray Victor Zulu, XVZ. That is actually a really well-structured volatility product that will not just uh, roll itself into oblivion. Yeah, so, you obviously have a lot of roll issues, which... So. This, this even dialing it back for a second, this is obviously a case of a little bit of knowledge being a dangerous thing. We've encountered this a lot. VIX has obviously penetrated quite a bit with the retail masses. The investing public is cognizant of it to various degrees. Sounds like this advisor is a little bit as well. He's heard the off-repeated refrain on things like CNBC that VIX is low, the fair gauge is low. That obviously resonated with him to enough to find a vehicle that at least incorporates VIX in it in some way, shape, or form. And that's what he's recommending to his clients because he thinks that's the right way to go. So this is a, a perfect example of a little bit of knowledge being a dangerous thing. And I definitely rec follow Mark's advice of uh, find a new financial advisor, but at the very least, do not buy this. This is a uh, yeah, because then you get all the issues we talked about so many times on the show in the past, the role and how that impacts you. And that people don't understand who don't really haven't really traded indexes and these kinds of products and futures options uh, actively, how important the role is in these products. And if it's not handled well, it could really destroy a lot of your profits. And pro products like VXX are, are, are certainly a good example of a, yeah. perhaps not the in, best role management in the world. Right. In the so. very, very near term, VXX is path dependency is on the VIX. But over the long term, it is a, a slave to roll the, the contango structure of the VIX and thus is essentially going to go to zero, just like TVIX. So the only product that actually kind of is well-structured that I've found is XBZ. So um, now, now would be a good time to throw in a little tease here 
I'm, I'm not going to give you any conclusions at all because we're still working, but I think I mentioned a little while ago that in our interest in taking a look at historical uh, simulations of trying to look at the value of potentially adding uh, vol contracts to a portfolio with a certain percentage overlay to perhaps uh, uh, protect against uh, very big down moves or uh, enhance sharp ratio by lowering overall volatility. We have been working with uh, graduate students at uh, uh, ITT, and we have been creating an enormous database, not only obviously of existing products such as VIX futures, but actually simulating what prices uh, would have most logically have been for vol contracts had they been trading, and, and this is going back uh, for over 20 years worth of data. And the, uh, the goal is to take a look at just the kind of discussion that we're having now, and that is uh, what the potential might be for any kind of uh, allocation of a volatility product to an equity portfolio and uh, what the performance uh, might be. And, and we're, we're really finding some extremely interesting things. Uh, we're, we're not quite done because not only is the vehicle important, as everybody has just spoke about VXX and, and, and the problems as, as using that as your surrogate for owning a volatility. So not only do you get different results as to whether you do a realized volatility contract, a VIX futures contract, uh, any kind of uh, other uh, swap or, or overlay, but then you, then you get into the optimization of the uh, kind of allocation. Should I be in these all the time? Should I try some sort of uh, uh, moving average of market or volatility threshold levels where I might try to enhance returns with the volatility product by being in and out of them according to some algorithm and lighten up at certain areas, get heavier with others, be out of them altogether. So we are we are investigating this kind of uh, every which way to Sunday, and we're, we're finding lots of very, very interesting things. I, I hope we're going to come out with that study uh, rather soon and uh, uh, possibly show some of the challenges of these kinds of overlays, but, but clearly uh, in, in times of market stress, some of the benefits as well. You know, Don, when you're finished with that study, I'm going to take you with me to one of these big, let's say, Morningstar advisor conferences, and we're going to get up there and we're going to present <laughs> the value of having a volatility portion or even just an options portion to a, a portfolio sure. because right now it just is non-existent and so much of the mainstream audience and the mainstream uh. money managers who, like we see, have, have amassed substantial amounts of money under management who have no, no knowledge, not even cognizant of these very basic tenets. So and, I, think that, know, I think that would be uh, an interesting uh, thing to present and see them see their minds be blown as we're presenting the information well you know again i don't want to steal i don't want to steal any of the thunder of the actual results because we're really not finished yet but you know clearly what what everybody might might think is is really uh, uh close to being the truth and that is just blindly long-term indiscriminately owning any kind of you know vix futures in perpetuity or or even vol contracts uh is a very challenging endeavor you are paying a risk premium uh these uh contracts traditionally sell for levels that are somewhat higher than what mm -hmm. actual volatility goes on to be so as a long-term buy and hold it's rather uh difficult to show the uh, the ongoing benefits, but but there are all sorts of ways of getting around that, both in terms of the absolute levels of volatility that you're looking at, different kinds of allocations, uh, obviously the different products that you use, and and when we do that, and particularly when we study certain you know key 
periods that encompass, you know, uh, 2007, 8, 9 and stuff like that, uh, the enhanced sharp ratios, the lowered volatilities, in some cases, even the increased returns over simply an S&P portfolio become very, very compelling to look at. So again, we'll we'll have more on this topic in, in the weeks and months ahead, but it, it really is quite a fascinating one. Well, I'm looking forward to it. I'm sure our listeners are looking forward to it. And speaking of our listeners, next up here we have a tweet from uh, Isha, I-S-H-A, I'm not sure, Isha6, and <laughs> she or he writes, uh, why are VIX cash and FM, I'm assuming he means front month VIX futures, the same right now? And this is a topic we've hit on a couple times in some of our other shows. It's a relatively recent development, so I'm not sure we've had a chance to really discuss it on this program recently. But what, of course, he's referring to is the fact that an off-hit topic we've hit on this show many times of how the VIX cash is extremely disassociated from what the VIX futures are actually doing. You know, Mark mentioned the term structure earlier. Traditionally, that term structure has been bit out of control. Uh, even the front month or near-term VIX future has, been, has had a substantial premium to where the VIX cash has been trading. And over the past week or so, we've seen that premium uh he says they're the same they're not the same but they're it's, it's eroded substantially this is probably refresh my memory if i'm wrong mark but this is the lowest this is the closest i mean aside from like expiration day and those types of odd events this is the this is the more closest to parity i've seen vix cash and the near-term vix future yeah, in a long it's been, time it's been really yeah they've been really trading on top of each other um and uh you know it's been real interesting to watch that i've i've not seen anything like this it makes me you know, it made me worry that we might be going to, you know, the, I thought the way the VIX was trading that we weren't going to get QE, and then it ended up that we did, and then the spread widened, and then the spread is just tightened again. So who knows? Apparently, everybody thinks 14 and a half is the fair price then. That's yeah, you know, it, it's a weird one, and this kind of gets into some of the, you know, the miasma floating around VIX. We talked about so many times of these various products and how how there's so many masters to the VIX contract right now and different people doing different things that have very little to do with the actual implied volatility of the SPX and why mm -hmm. these why the VIX futures have been or the VIX futures have sold off, VIX cash has been bid up, why it, that exact ratio has worked out this way right now, it's uh, your guess is as good as mine. It's definitely an intriguing scenario. And you're right, usually that tends to point to some sort of explosive event happening, and apparently that was supposed to be the QE3, and it did happen. And then you're right, it tightened right back up again. So it's it's it, VIX has been a weird beast uh, to watch lately, and I yeah, yeah. I, I kind well, of I have been scratching need, my head I with think, this parody lately. I think people need to get used to the fact that the VIX may be below 16 for the next year. To let to the guy who no. bought two thousand or twenty thousand of the Feb 70s. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. That's just that you know I was talking to someone at this conference again this week about how that that crazy frame of reference we're always talking about with VIX and how just uh, how nuts it is. Don, here's a quick one for you. I think you can answer this in probably two seconds. Uh, a tweet from Theo19. He writes, Don, is there ever a case when you would buy vol? So have at it, sir. I would say that. If, if, if vol was zero, I suppose I couldn't lose. So, you know, that, that might be one instance. But uh, You want um, pure intrinsic value. <laughs> you know, I, look, I, I, I had a philosophy for a long time. It's, it's obviously uh, too radical. It's not that I recommend it for anyone. And I'm not even claiming that, you know, long term it's correct. But the, the manner in which we were able to buy volatility – in my day of trading was through options. You know, I, I often said, you can't call up the exchange and say, may I have some volatility, please, because they're not selling it. So you bought or you sold straddles or strangles, and you either rooted for volatility or against it, depending on whether you were long or short. And because of my casino and uh, gaming background and, you know, my blackjack knowledge and probability theory, it became clear to me very early on when I was trading options that there seemed to be this overriding, if you want to call it, house advantage or bias towards the sell side and selling the risk premium rather than buying it. And that became a philosophy of mine that if you do this day in and day out for a living over the long run, you obviously wind up ahead of the game selling time premium and that risk premium that was inherent in options rather than buying it. 
And uh, it, it worked very nicely with me for a very long time. I've been off uh, a, a trading desk for many, many years now. Times change. Not only do the markets change, but the products change. And now we've got all of these volatility products where in one form or another, you really can say, uh, let me buy some volatility or let me sell some volatility. And I'm sure that there are circumstances where you study charts and where you study um, probabilities and you look at vol cones. Uh, we're going to consider a question about that later on. And you see that, you know, 90 percent of the time volatility has been higher than it is right now and things like that. And the, the only question that remains then is, does that mitigate towards actually buying volatility right then? Or as you know, I used to joke, just not selling volatility then, because do you, do you ever get at a point where you're not paying this risk premium and where the, the, the risk is warranted for, for uh, buying? Um, it, it, it's, it's few and far between in the number of cases that I see of that. And, and so I'm more inclined to say, let me stay out of the market and not uh, sell volatility if I feel that it's a dangerous environment. But that doesn't mean that I'm rushing out to buy it either. <laughs> Don, Don, a very nuanced explanation of your sell or don't sell uh, philosophy, I suppose we can call it at this point. Uh, next up, we have a, uh, a Facebook post here from John Nestez. He writes, you guys are always talking about volatility skew. I recently noticed that in Apple, the calls were bid substantially over the puts. Is that an oh, unusual really? phenomenon? <laughs> are there any other names you can think of where that is the case? And he's obviously referring from a volatility perspective. And right. uh, yes, the first answer, the first part of that question, is that an unusual phenomenon? The answer is yes. In most very large, liquid, widely held equity uh, the predominance of the paper flow is large funds coming in to sell calls for income and buy puts for protection. So that right. tends to generate a very specific skew shape and a very specific skew slope. And that usually means the calls are dramatically lower on a volatility perspective than the puts are. And that is usually the case across the board, except for a couple of these odd duck names. And we always joke here on the show about Apple and the zealots. But that is what you're referring to here is specifically, I guess you can call that Apple zealot premium. People have this upside obsession with Apple and they will bid up that upside call skew to levels that are, are rarely seen uh, in large liquid equities, let alone, you know, across in any equity at all. Uh, you, know, you might expect that in some crazy name that might have a pending takeover rumor or something like that, or people are yeah, or like bidding a, the calls. A stock, uh, you know, biotech. Exactly. A biotech market. where there's a lot of yeah, potential upside. Just to put things in perspective, the last time a bunch of tech companies, the only time you'll see, I've seen this before, and so has Mark, and so has Don, and it was 1999 during the tech bubble where we saw calls higher than puts. Yahoo at 400, baby. Can't, can't, can't go down. Yeah, we saw that during that tech bubble, and then it quickly dissipated, and Part of what's going on in Apple is that a lot of people can't afford to buy the stock, so they go to the options. Um, but another part of it says, you know, it's kind of, you know, another part of it is just, I think that there's a little bit of overzealousness. It's the Apple Zealot premium. That's what it is. And it's it's amazing to see it manifest so dramatically and so physically in the marketplace. But this is the perfect example. And there aren't many other names I can think of off the top of my head recently that have exhibited this that aren't, like you said, the small biotech that's about to pop or be taken over or something mm -hmm. like that. Uh, certainly not large liquid names like this. I traded Intel actively for many years as a market maker out there. There was, I can't recall ever once having a moment where the where the big where the upside call wing was even close to uh, to parity with the puts it just never happened so this is a, a definitely an odd odd scenario and uh, you know you had this big announcement coming for the iphone and it was known for weeks and weeks for the new iphone 5 and uh listeners probably know that uh uh, the normal skew for equities, be it indices or individual names, is that 
downward sloping to the right where you start higher for the below the market options and you know it decreases as you go up in uh, strike price but you probably also know that when you know have something like uh, uh, FX and currency where you're talking about one currency with respect to the other like uh, you know euro dollar or any relationship uh, the the options uh, skew is not that way at all, but it's like a parabola. It's a U-shape where it goes up on either side. It makes no difference whether the euro, you know, outpaces the dollar or the dollar outpaces the euro. Any big move in either direction can can make you money, and so you you've got this kind of a more symmetric type of looking thing. In this particular case, I'm I'm assuming that that with Apple, um, you had so much interest in the impending announcement and this uh, Apple mania and the zealots that you talking about that you know people just equally wanted to hold the calls for any kind of upside pop after the announcement as they would have the puts if for some reason this thing fizzled or was disappointing and so you had more of almost you know like this u-shape type of thing where any kind of strong movement in one direction or the other was uh, was going to be the appetite of the options investors so you had you had that kind of a thing and in this case the call even greater still to the upside. All right, Don, and last up here on the old mailbag, we have a tweet that I think is going to be near and dear to your heart, and of course, if Bob was on the show, he probably would love this one as well. This is a tweet from Dex, and he says, are there any tools that lets you trade off of volatility cones? And it's an interesting question. It kind of alludes to a topic we've hit on a few times in the show earlier, which is being able to trade off of essentially uh, implied volatility levels off the top of my head i don't know of any tools that let you do this don are you familiar with any no i think somebody would actually have to build them but you know i'd have ideas of what you could possibly do so so we have an extensive database of uh, these volatility cones that go back over time periods and then give you uh you know uh, by by 10 or 20 percentage levels of uh uh, those points where volatility has been higher or lower than the particular numbers that you're looking at. So on our website in the pull down menu, if you look at data and then you look at vol X indices, and finally in the third sub menu, you find vol X cones. When you go to the cones, you've got all the different asset types. You can do this for currencies, equity, commodities, or interest rates. And in the indices, for example, you can do it for uh, the S&P, the NASDAQ, you can do it for Russell, and uh, you can do it for uh, Hong Kong, Japan, South Korea, India, et cetera. And, and what you get are different time frames as well, going back one, two, three, five, 10, 20 years or so. There's a tremendous amount of data at your disposal. What you would then have to do is somehow kind of integrate or, or build an engine that would superimpose current market data, such as volatility uh, futures levels and uh, those products that would allow you to trade volatility and compare them to the regime that you're seeing right now with vol cones. For example, we spoke about past uh, levels of S&P and NASDAQ volatility, and I ran that quickly over the cones, and we're at about the 20% level right now. What that means is that the volatility that those indices are displaying right now is about 80% of the time higher than it is currently. Only 20% of the time have volatility levels of NASDAQ and S&P been as low as they are right now from a realized point of view. So that's the tool. That's, that's what it tells you. Whether or not you, know, you can make money trading this, now you got to go look out for the products that you can trade. Uh, in this case, you know, maybe you think, well, I want to buy volatility. Well, the problem is if everybody knows that volatility is low, when you go to buy volatility, they're not going to let you buy it for 10 or for 12. You're going to buy a vol contract or a VIX futures or a VXX or an ETN, whatever the case may be, and, and the premium is, is likely to be built in. Or maybe you've got to buy 16 
Well, maybe you've got to buy, you know, a NASDAQ 18 or something like that. Now it becomes much more challenging because although volatility may actually go higher, is it going to go high enough to compensate you for the premium that you're spending, which, you know, back uh, full circle to my rather sell rather than buy volatility, that's always the problem. So I suppose you could build such a tool. You'd have to integrate current prices with the vol cones, give you signals that you, you would be happy buying or selling, you know, when it's stretched in one direction or the other, maybe 20 percent, 80 percent or whatever makes you comfortable. But, you know, no, no guarantees. <laughs> yeah, this this harkens back to that discussion we had. Uh, a few, it's been more than a few shows now. It's been a while back, but about the difficulty of doing exactly that, of executing off some of these Greeks like Vega or other things, uh, and why haven't brokers adapted tools for that? And it, it's, as we concluded on that show, you know, it's just a very difficult process to implement. And your Vega of 30 is a little bit different than what your neighbor's Vega of 30 might be, and they may have a different model running. And there's a lot of other elements that go into that that make executing off of everything except, a, except price which is a universal across the board. Once you get beyond price, any other element that you try to execute off of is extremely difficult. And you, for this example, you'd have to build in, you're right, like Don said, some sort of model that would essentially key to a certain price level that corresponded to that lower band of the volatility cone or to the upper band, and then you would execute off price again. And there'd have to be some sort of human intervention, I would imagine, to execute that for you. Couldn't have some automated system do that. Uh, but it just uh, it's an interesting idea. A lot of people want to do this. A lot of people think of themselves as volatility traders, and in many respects you are when you're trading options. So they want to key off that, and they want to trade off that, and yet the, the tools aren't there, and there's so much fudge factor in these in these Greeks that I'm not sure if you really want to do that. <laughs> interesting idea, interesting in theory, I think in practice, a, a much more uh, perhaps difficult to implement and perhaps disturbing concept. And before we go, Don, I, th I have another answer for you for your when would you buy vol uh, question. That, of course, would be after all those juicy, juicy sales that you made had decayed essentially to zero and you wanted to take it off your books before the weekend. Then you'd come in and buy some ball, I would think. Well, yeah, buy to buy close, to close. Is never a problem. <laughs> <laughs> with, with options, as listeners know, kind of a little bit different from, from futures contracts where you don't specify. But when you trade options, you're, you're always uh, uh, held to declaring whether this is an opening position and you're creating new open interest or whether this is a closing position where you're taking open interest off the table. And yes, you know, if I sold options for four dollars and they decayed to an eighth or a teeny, I kind of swallowed hard and still didn't like it. But I'd usually buy them back to close saying uh, <laughs> I've taken about as much out of this as makes sense and leave the last teeny or eighth for somebody so else. To maybe amend your title to Don. No problem buying to close, Schlesinger. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you for that, Don. And thank you to all of the listeners out there who wrote in and enjoy participating in the show. We couldn't do the show without you, and it certainly makes doing the show much more fun to have your feedback and your questions and your comments. So keep them coming in. Post those comments in the optionsinsider.com's new uh, discuss comment system, or you can hit us up via Twitter or Facebook or even email us at questions at the optionsinsider.com, and we'll get those questions onto the show. So that's it for the mailbag this week, and now we're going to dive right into our crystal ball segment. And now we take a look at the crystal ball. All right, and welcome to the crystal ball segment. This is, of course, a portion of the show where we peer into the murky ether of the future from a volatility perspective. And first up on the old crystal ball panel, we have Mr. Sebastian. What does your crystal ball tell you next week at this time, Mr. Sebastian? I think we're going to be in a, a period of time with extended low implied vols. And by low, I mean, you know, 16 or lower, which if you look historically at VIX, it has a 16, 17 is a much more normal number than 20 or 21. Um, but, you know, because of kind of the lower bound limits, the mean is much higher than 16 or 17. So 
I think we're going to be staying around 14 to 16, maybe 17 for the time being. Um, and, you know, I, I just don't see how, uh, I don't see a lot of things to cause us to go to 30, uh, which is exactly why we, you know, obviously then we we're obviously going to go to 30 now that I've said something like that. <laughs> You're on record, um, so of course we're going. Right. But, you know, I just don't see anything on the horizon that could really fall apart. Um, that unless we like, unless we bomb Iran, that's about the only thing I think that's currently on the horizon that could turn into a real problem. Or perhaps Libya or some of the other ones, or yeah, Egypt, or yeah. perhaps all of the above, given what's been happening in, in the world of late. Uh, but the Fed is going to pump in so much cheap money. Now they're buying mortgage backs. Yeah. Unbelievable. Fa- the put is the put is in full effect. Well, all right. And Don, uh, what are you? I have a feeling. I think I know what you're going to say. But uh, what are you? What is your crystal ball telling you for the land of Nasdaq for the coming week? Well, I'm 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 really not sure what I'm going to say because I I, I have mixed emotions, and I'll tell you why. I just listened to Mark, and you know I'm listening. I'm looking at at VIX today, and despite the fact that it's a weekend which normally portends that they take out some vol in anticipation of Saturday and Sunday. And despite the fact that the S&P is up about five handles as we speak, we have VIX up a half a point. We have VIX up actually on the day three and a half uh, percent. And whereas that's not anything terribly dramatic, I think it kind of argues towards the fact that when when you get down to such low levels, perhaps not historically, but at least for you know several of of the past years, um, options sellers just reach a level where they say, you know, am I going to really sell these options for thirteen implied volatility? And it's almost like a, a, an unwritten rule that this is about as low as you let things go, and and when you see that you you stretch to those kind of limits, uh, you know. Often there's there's really only one way to predict because you're you're really at the the very very low end of the range. So so that's VIX and that's Nasdaq VIX and implied volatility. From a, a realized perspective, we're, we're surely still at rather low levels, but. Uh, the the part that that's hard is that the markets are so strong and the markets continue to move. I, I don't think you can have these huge, you know, 20 handle moves on any kind of a regular basis. So if the market moves, but it, it moves in a more orderly fashion and it moves up, but it, it, it doesn't do so with the kind of dramatic volatility that we've had lately, you, you just might see these uh, realized volatilities level off somewhat, if not actually start to drop again. So, so this is a tough call. This is, this is a hard one. And one final statistic that I would point out that very few people look at and that you, you really don't hear quoted at all is the volatility of volatility, how quickly short-term volatility itself as an asset is actually moving around. And we are at an extraordinary point right now on the S&P for vol of vol. The one month volatility of volatility itself is 221. And I checked before coming on the air, we go back some 35 years to 1980 or or just before in our data on uh, our website. And I looked for spikes in vol of vol that were above 200. And this is only the fifth time in 35 years that we've been at these levels. And the previous ones were 1987, the crash, uh, Gulf War, 1990 or 91, uh, the tech bubble that we were talking about uh, just a few minutes ago, and 2008, Lehman, and uh, uh, four years ago. Those are some auspicious, so, uh, auspicious dates. So you've got some incredible dates there. And those were the only times that the volatility of volatility itself and how it moved around and how violently it moved around had ever reached levels of above 200. 
And we actually are in that period right now without having any kind of market catastrophes, but with just having an awful lot of days where we've got a tremendous amount of movement. And the only thing I can say to you is if you're a student of the past, uh, these spikes, as fast as they go up, they come down. They're unsustainable. So I think you're, you're in for perhaps calmer times as people perhaps wait into the election to see what's going to happen. And I really don't think that the vol of vol is sustainable, which might also argue for the fact that, you know, any any type of big moves in volatility up or down uh, are unlikely to happen as well. Uh, I think I see a, a future vol of vol contract in the vol in the volatility exchanges future there, Don. Uh, uh, certainly has been <laughs> talked about. <laughs> That'll be your, your gamma, super gamma equivalent, I suppose you could call it. Yeah, we didn't know how many people would have the stomach for trading a, a vehicle with 200 uh, volatility <laughs> itself, but uh, it's been kicked around. That would, be, that would be an interesting one. And you're right, it is. We are in this very, very odd environment, as we talked about earlier, where we essentially have this upside, almost upside crash type of scenario where we're all moving to the upside aggressively uh, and recording this today in mid-session here in uh, – on Friday, and we're most of the indices, major indices, up about at least half a percent. Nasdaq's up a full one percent. VIX Cash up about three and a half percent. Vol up across the board. Going into a weekend, no less. This is this is odd on any day. Going into a weekend, it's doubly odd. Uh, so yeah, we have this very odd upside type crash, upside vol inflation. Uh, if you will, which is another interesting uh, scenario to watch unfold here in the marketplace. Gets back to what Mark alluded to earlier about how uh, most of the major vol days have been to the upside of late since June. And we're certainly seeing that playing out in the marketplace today. Very odd. Uh, looks like people are not thinking, even though QE3 has come in, that put has been put into place. People are still wondering if there's some other shoes left to drop out there because they're they're bidding up this vol even as we rally, uh, which is odd. And of course, over the last few months, there's been a total. Uh, there's been no tendency at all in the marketplace to want to hold vol going into a weekend. They blasted it out every chance they can get. So to hold it going into this weekend is uh, perhaps even triply odd. Uh, interesting, interesting one. We'll have to keep an eye on this for next week's show and maybe come back to it and see exactly how the vol unfolds. But unfortunately, that is going to do it for this episode of Volatility Views. Uh, but before we go, all my cohorts here on the on the All Star panel. I want to give you a chance to let us know what's going on in your neck of the woods, starting off with you, Mr. Sebastian, what is coming up in the land of optionpit.com. You know, next Wednesday, Dennis Chen and I are going to be presenting on our book, The Option Traders Hedge Fund. We're going to kind of go through uh, some different approaches that we use to trade, and, uh, you know, we're just going to talk about the book. By the way, the book is still for sale, uh, and it's an excellent book. Mark Mark's uh, Longo loved it. And uh, I'm on record as saying I've loved it, so I can't go back now. That is true. (laughs) And uh, I finally got you your hard copy. And so, yeah, go out and buy the book and uh, check out our uh, webinar next Wednesday. All right. Check out optionpit.com for that webinar and more exciting events from the world of options. Thank you for that, Mark. And Don, what is the latest? What is the latest and greatest over there at volex.us? Well, you know, I alluded to it earlier, and we're we're kind of uh, excited about the potential for uh, uh, this this study that that I was speaking about. Uh, I, I can't promise exactly when uh, we'll we'll have all the information available, but it really will be sooner rather than later, and uh, we'll we'll eventually release it to the website and probably uh, print up uh, brochures so that. If and when you stop by at uh, uh, the big conference uh, in Chicago, uh, Futures Conference, uh, Futures Industry, uh, we will, uh, you know, probably have more more data available for everyone. But uh, I think this is going to be an important study, and it's going to allow people to take a look at the relative merits of owning. Uh, volatility contracts and volatility instruments and a manner in which they can be utilized in conjunction with a portfolio or for a hedge fund or a portfolio manager and perhaps with suggestions for allocation that will enhance returns. So um, we're we're well into this and uh, uh, hopefully it won't be too much longer. 
And while we're on the subject of website tweaks and the latest features online, of course, we did just do a major overhaul, like I said earlier, of the optionsinsider.com. So if you haven't visited the site lately, I encourage you to surf on over there and check it out. A lot of interesting new features, including that comment system that I alluded to earlier. We're also making it even easier for you to find your favorite Options Insider Radio Network programming on the website. We're going to be adding more individual tabs for the different shows and individual pages for them, including ball view, so you'll be able to find out more information, find your favorite episodes, show notes, all that fun stuff from the show. So I encourage you to surf on over to theoptionsinsider.com and check it out for yourself. But unfortunately, that is going to do it for this episode of the show. But before we go, I want to thank all of you out there in the listening audience for downloading and streaming and subscribing to this program and making it such a fun program to do and such a success. And we'll see you next time right here on Volatility Views. Thank you for listening to Volatility Views. Join us next week as we keep our listeners on the cutting edge of finance and risk management with lively topics relating to volatility. Volatility Views is brought to you by the Volatility Exchange. If you'd like to learn more about vol contracts, please visit www.volx.us. If you'd like to submit a question for the hosts, then surf over to www.theoptionsinsider.com slash forum and post your question in the Volatility Views Forum. Questions can also be submitted via email at questions at theoptionsinsider.com or via Twitter at twitter.com slash options and twitter.com slash volx underscore info. Facebook users can submit their feedback via the Options Insider and Volatility Exchange Facebook pages. Voicemails are also welcome at 312-544-9356. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you next time on Volatility Views. The views expressed on this program are not intended as investment advice and do not constitute an offer to sell or a solicitation of an offer to buy any securities or other financial instruments and may not be relied upon in connection with the purchase or sale of any security or other financial instrument. The the opinions presented on this program represent those of the speakers and do not reflect the views of either the Options Insider Incorporated or the Volex Group Corporation. The preceding program was a presentation of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com radio or search for Options Insider Radio in iTunes. 